Hey everyone, I thought I'd talk about some of the upgrades I've been making to my scanning electron microscope in the past few weeks. Uh, but first, I want to give a big thanks to the FEI company for helping me out with this new turbo molecular pump and also a Pirani vacuum gauge that I've been using on my sputtering setup. So this equipment is super helpful to me and I am very grateful. So here's a quick recap of how the scanning electron microscope column works. At the top we've got an electron gun and this sprays out a stream of electrons that are uh, expanding in a fan. And the reason that the beam expands is because the electrons are like charged and they naturally repel each other. So even if you had a perfectly collimated beam of electrons, it would actually spread out all by itself. In this case, the electron gun itself forms a, a slight lens, an electron lens. So the electrons shoot off in a cone pattern. And in this particular setup, the, the spot at the bottom is about you know, two or three centimeters in diameter if there were no optics in the column at all. Instead, what we want to do for electron microscopy is to actually focus the beam down to a very tight point when it hits the sample at the bottom. And so to do that, we make this column long because the longer the column is, the easier our job is uh, in using electron optics to focus this thing down. Uh, it's the same reason that telescopes and microscopes are physically long. It's just because uh, moving those photons or electrons like takes some space. And what we do is we add a, a lens. This was called a condenser lens. And it takes the beam that we've generated from this electron gun and focuses it down again. So there's sort of a crossover point here, just like you'd have a crossover point with a magnifying glass. The light sort of crosses over, forms a focus, and then starts expanding again. And uh, we do that so that we can make the most parallel beam of electrons down here. And we do this with a combination of these electron lenses and pinholes. So you can see on the diagram here, there's a pinhole going into this first lens and then a pinhole down here. And the whole purpose of this whole setup here is just to get a very um, collimated thin beam of electrons here. So the next step is to scan this very thin collimated beam of electrons across our sample. So this way we can sort of build up an image by scanning the sample in a raster pattern, basically filling up the image pixel by pixel. And we have a couple options. We could either use a magnetic field to move those electrons, or we could use an electric field. Now generally most modern electron microscopes use a magnetic field because uh, you can get a stronger magnetic field more easily. So you can make the whole column more compact and allow it to do more uh, by, by concentrating a magnetic field. However, the problem with that is that you need to make iron pole pieces and the shape is very sensitive to how the, the, you know, the, the shape affects how it operates in a very critical way. So an easier solution that isn't as quite as high performance is to use electrostatic deflection. And it's easier because all we need is a couple of plates, just a plate on either side of the electron beam. And then we just put a voltage across those two plates and the electron beam will be deflected as it goes through the electric field formed by those two plates. And so in the video today, I'm going to talk about uh, the amplification or the driver that I made that drives the voltage on these deflection plates. And then after we've deflected the beam, there's a final focusing lens that will take this collimated, you know, very thin but collimated beam of electrons and actually focus it down to a point right onto the uh, surface of the thing that we want to image. I don't have the lens installed right now, but it would go right below these deflection plates. So originally I was using a disassembled oscilloscope to generate the voltages that I need on these deflection plates to move the electron beam around. And this worked out pretty well because the oscilloscope already has amplifiers to uh, amplify a small input signal, could only be like a volt or even less, and amplify that all the way up to the hundreds of volts that we need to move the electron beam around. And conveniently, oscilloscopes already have an electrostatic cathode ray tube. That's, that's how these old analog scopes worked. And so all I had to do is unhook the deflection plates in the CRT and hook the scope circuit up to the deflection plates in my electron microscope. So it was sort of a, a really low work, pretty high performance solution. However, I did end up running into problems. The voltage available was only about, I think, 150 or 200 volts, which wasn't quite enough. So I couldn't scan a very big area because the voltages were just not high enough to move that electron beam enough and the offsets or the available range of offsets was limited uh, because of this and that was the sort of the biggest problem. So I wanted to have a circuit 
that I uh, would be a little bit more adaptable to what I was doing and also mainly just to use a higher voltage. And I found this circuit uh, made by uh, Rehad Wabi, I, I hope I'm getting your name correct, at uh, web.jfet.org. And this guy builds uh, oscilloscope clocks and similar things and also needed a deflection circuit to drive CRTs. So I've modified his circuit a little bit, uh, but the main gist of it is that it's a, a single-ended to differential uh, amplifier. So we put our positive voltage across the top here, and then we have common emitter uh, single transistor amplifiers, and they're coupled together with this pot here. So as we put a, an input signal here, let's say 0 to 5 volts, uh, these amplifiers, this is non-inverting and this is inverting, and so what we have up here are two signals that are out of phase with each other. And that's good because that means that the average voltage between these two output lines is go always going to be about the same, so that as one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa, but they always average out to about the same. If they didn't, if there was a common mode change, or if the average voltage did actually change, then these deflection plates would start working like a lens. But unfortunately, they only exist, the deflection plates are only in one axis. And so what we'd have is a lens that only functions in one axis and not the other. And that would cause astigmatism, which is basically if the beam becomes sort of oval-shaped instead of round. Now, if you can control that, that's actually a good thing because we can correct for astigmatism that's caused by other uh, things in the system. We can actually make an astigmatism corrector. However, if we don't have control over it, then you might get astigmatism uh, and you, know, you can't correct for it. This circuit will introduce a slight amount of common mode voltage changing and you can't actually control it that easily. Uh, but I'm working on some tweaks that will uh, fix that. The transistors are ZTX458, which are a good high voltage transistor that can take up to about 400 volts and also have pretty good gain. I think the gain is about 200 on these. And so I've set the circuit up with a 350 volt rail here, and I'm using 470k ohm uh, pull-up resistors here. So it's a basic common emitter amplifier where if we put some current into the transistor, uh, it will pull down on this resistor here and lower the voltage here. So when the transistors are not conducting anything, the voltage on these lines is very close to the rail. And when the transistor is fully conducting, then uh, the voltage is very close to ground, although it's a little bit off because of the emitter resistor there. Originally, the circuit had an additional transistor in here so that he could use a much higher supply rail. Since I don't have that uh, set up on my circuit here, I just took out that transistor and then lowered the supply voltage down to about 350 volts. This pot controls the offset, basically where the scanning is going to happen. It basically just moves the whole uh, center point of this amplifier. And this pot controls the gain. So if this is a low value, then the coupling between these two amplifiers is very tight and you'll get a very high gain. So I soldered the circuit together on some vector board and added an op amp just to um, provide like a, a voltage follower on the input. So the input impedance to this amplifier is relatively low and I wanted to drive it from a PWM output which is going to have a relatively high output impedance. So the op amp fixes that problem. I'm using an old rack mount high voltage supply for the 350 volt rail and the current draw in sort of a worst case scenario would be uh, 2 to 3 milliamps. Okay, let's fire it up. The first step is to turn on the roughing vacuum pump and you'll actually be able to see the blades of the turbo pump turning just from the air being drawn through it. Okay, so after about 5 or 10 minutes the thermocouple gauge is showing uh, between 500 and 1000 millitor and I'm going to switch on the turbo pump and the readout here is a 0 to 10 scale that indicates uh, the speed of the turbo pump. So this, this pump has a built-in controller and you basically just tell it to go on and it will ramp up the speed automatically. So when uh, the reading is 10, 10 volts on that uh, meter, the speed is about 70,000 RPM. And as you can see, look how fast the gauge declines. Um, the, the turbo pump is able to start pumping from the 500 millitor range and take it all the way down to high vacuum in sort of one swoop.
Okay, so we've been pumping for about 10 or 20 minutes and we're down to about five times 10 to the minus five millibar. So now we'll move over to the control side and turn on the filament and then also turn on the high voltage supply. So I've got a bit of phosphor coated glass in there taken from an oscilloscope CRT and we can see that when the power comes on there's now a tiny little green spot where the electron beam is hitting the phosphor. So the beam has been uh, expanded and collimated by that uh, series of lenses and pinholes that I talked about but there's currently no focus and no deflection happening. However, if I turn on the deflection amplifier, we can see a little Christmas tree. So I uh, borrowed this code from uh, John De Cristofaro, uh, known as John Janier, who uh, came up with this cool little hack a few years ago. And he's using an Arduino to generate uh, PWM, and then the PWM is smoothed out into analog voltages. So you can feed this into your XY mode on the oscilloscope and have a nice little uh, Christmas tree graphic there. So I can use the control pots in the amplifier to move this image around. And you can see that when we get close to one of the extremes, it will start bunching up because the deflection plates have sort of run out of the ability to actually uh, move the electron beam. But as you can see, the range is actually pretty good. And of course, we also have control over the scale. Here's a more typical raster scan pattern. So this is covering a square area and it's being scanned very slowly so that you can see the movement of the beam. Here's a back and forth raster scan. Uh, with digital acquisition, it doesn't make sense to return the beam all the way to one side. And so here we're just scanning back and forth and covering a, a whole rectangle that way. And here we are going much faster. So now you can see the area that it's actually tracing out. And of course we could do the back and forth in the Y direction as well. Uh, instead of returning to one edge like it is now. Unfortunately, the PWM output from the Arduino is not even close to fast enough to get a real-time image out of this, at least I don't think. And so I, I think what I'm going to have to do is implement a microcontroller with a true DAC to get the bandwidth and the accuracy that I want out of this. Uh, but that'll be a topic for a future video. Okay, see you next time. Bye.